Ephesians chapter 1. going to look at a passage that reflects on the sovereignty of God. Uh, the title of my message is God Has a Plan. I, when, when I was getting ready to leave, I'd put my, my backpack and my briefcase and my coat hanger with my jacket and stuff in the car, and, and I'd come up to say bye to my wife, and I was at the top of the stairs and going, and she says, well, I'm going to be praying for you all today as you do all that you've got to do. I said, well, it's out of my hands, uh, especially at this point. And I said, and it really never has been in my hands. It's all been in the hands of the church, as, as, of the, the Father, as he expresses, expresses himself through uh, the church, the body of Christ. So this passage of Scripture honors God. I told you, I think last week or week before last, I said what we're doing is random sermons from Ephesians. And we've been in last and early and uh, we'll probably, uh, next week is Pentecost uh, Sunday. Baptists usually don't celebrate Pentecost, but I'm going to preach uh, from the text that Peter preached from in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, just because I really love that passage of Scripture. So that's what, we're, what I will be preaching next Sunday, Acts chapter 2, uh, titled Jesus, Lord, and Christ. But this morning we're looking at Ephesians under the idea of God has a plan. If you want to stand for the reading of the word, uh, I will read from the English Standard Version beginning at verse 3 of chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace, which, with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace which He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of His will according to His purpose, which He set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in Him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of Him, who works all things according to the counsel of His will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of His glory. In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Pray with me again. Father, we need Your grace. We need Your wisdom. We need Your unction, Your anointing, both to proclaim the word and also to receive the word. Father, we want to honor you in what we say here today. These basic truths that we're reminding your people of. That you have a plan. That your plan is not contingent. That your plan will be carried out deliberately. That you are in control. That your plan does not change. That your plan includes all things. Father, I pray that you will speak to us. And affirm those truths in our hearts and encourage us as we listen and respond to your Holy Spirit this day. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Uh, you probably noticed as I read two words that really jumped out. One was will and another was purpose. Uh, God has a will and a purpose and he's seeking to carry out that. I've called it God has a plan. Uh, we're not in a random universe that's just kind of bouncing from one thing to another, but we're in a universe, we're in a world 
that has purpose. And its purpose is to glorify God and to honor Him. And God has a plan that He is even now carrying out. Things that we see as perhaps taking place by chance or by God's design. Uh, this, this week we were, my wife and I went away for the beach. Our 47th anniversary was on Monday and we went down to, to Orange Beach and um, I, I sat on the beach and read, I read um, a Zane Gray novel. My dad has a collection, 40 volumes of Zane Gray. And every now and then I go and pluck a few volumes and there's about six of them in my house and I've read about four of them now. And I took one with me and I read uh, that novel and it's just good to escape into that Western world. But I also uh, started reading another book called The Sovereignty of God by Jeffrey D. Johnson who's a Baptist pastor out in, uh, in Arkansas. Uh, and this book just came out about three or four months ago and I've... I started reading in it and got kind of excited about God's purpose and His sovereignty. And uh, there, there may be some from what I read that comes out in this message, or I may stick to my notes, or we may do a, 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 a compilation of both of those. But first, we need to understand that God has a plan. He is in control. He is working out His plan. He has a plan for Friendship Baptist Church. He has a plan for your life. He has a plan for the life of your children. He is working out His plan. His plan started before the foundation of the world. Look at verse 4. Even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him in love. Um, at verse 11. In Him we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will. God is working out a plan. He's carrying that plan out. Now we may not see it and we may not be able to fully grasp it. And part of that is because God is infinite and we are finite. You know, some, sometimes Lou, I help Lou clean up after um, supper, and we've got leftovers, and I'll reach in the cabinet, and I'll get a Tupperware bowl or something like that, and I'll start to put the stuff out of the pan in that bowl, and I picked up too small of a bowl. <laughs> And there is no way that I can get it in there. Understanding the fullness of God's plan and what God is doing is like trying to put the contents of a six-quart pot into a two-quart Tupperware bowl. It does not work. It spills over. We are unable to grasp that because we are finite. But God has a plan. Pardon me. Excuse me. Um, and his, his plan results, the Bible tells us here, in the praise of His glory. His plan comes back to, to Himself and results in Him being honored and glorified and worshipped. Look at verse 6. To the praise of His glorious grace with which He blessed us in the Beloved. Verse 12. So that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of His glory. Verse 14, who is our guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. God's glory is above all. And He will sum all things up in His glory. His plan includes the salvation and the sanctification of those who come to faith in Christ. He's not just saving you to save you. He wants to grow you up in Christ and make you mature and make you holy like Him. Look at verses 9 and 10. Making known to us the mystery of His will according to the purpose which He set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in Him. Actually, those verses were for the next point. Verses 4, 5, and 7 uh, are the verses I wanted to hit on. Even, the, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy before Him. In love He predestined us. And I know that's a controversial doctrine, but it is a biblical doctrine. 
It's a word the Bible uses. He predestined us for adoption to Himself through Christ, according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace, with which He blessed us. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace. Jesus does not save us according to our goodness. The Father does not give us salvation based on who we are, but based on who Christ is. Christ is our salvation. And we gain salvation when we put trust and hope in Him and we receive from God the imputed righteousness of Christ. Maybe one day we will look at Romans and look at that doctrine of the imputation of Christ's righteousness to us. His salvation is the summing up of all things in Christ Jesus. That's what His plan is, verses 9 and 10 that we read just a moment ago. As a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in Him, things in heaven and things on earth. He's going to bring it together in Christ. God has a plan and a purpose. You know, there there are many theories of history, and there are... uh, those who say that history is cyclical, that it repeats itself. And in some ways we can see some observations, you know, we'll say what goes around comes around. Uh, my, my wife made a comment on my niece's Facebook page. She had, she had done something, she had cross-stitched, not cross-stitched, but, but knitted or something uh, together. You know, so some of the things the ladies do, the word's not coming to my mind. Uh, yesterday, and she had put a picture on Facebook, and my wife commented, yep, I wore something just like that in the 70s. <laughs> you know, it, it comes around. But when we read the Bible, we see that history is not really cyclical, even though there are patterns of cycles. For example, in the book of Judges, where they were walking with God, they would rebel against God, God would send judgment on them, and then God would raise up, a a judge, a deliverer for them. Uh, They would repent, they would be set free, and then they would sin again. And we see that cycle repeated. But as you read through the Bible, what comes through is that God has a purpose. Time had a beginning, and time will have an end. And history is moving toward that end, which Christ and God is pointing all things to, and we're working toward that end. There is, uh, history is lineal or linear for us. First point, God has a plan. Did you get that? Did I communicate that? God has a plan. Second point is, God's plan is not contingent. God's plan is not contingent. That it means it's not based on the circumstances. Many times I'll go into a situation and Lou will say, well, what are you going to do? He says, I'm not sure it's going to what's going on there. What we find. And we, we're contingent and we kind of rock. God is not like that. God knows everything. He knows your thoughts and your possible thoughts. And He has planned all that out. And He knows how it's working out. It's not that He foresees the future, it's that He planned the future. If He foresees the future and then adjusts His plan toward that, there's a power outside Himself that is functioning in opposition to Him. God is in control. Psalm 115.3 says, Our God is in the heavens. He does all that He pleases. Our God is in the heavens. He does all that He pleases. It does not change. His will, His plan does not change with circumstances as men's plans do. You know, we have contingency plans when we plan events. You've got something going outside. As I was driving, I was listening to the tail end of a podcast that my wife and I listened to when we were driving up from uh, South Alabama. And... uh, they were, uh, the, the people on the, the podcast were talking about graduation exercises in one of our seminaries. And one of them said they had talked to one of the professors who was in charge of the graduation ceremony at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary and said they were praying that it did not rain because they were having graduation of those around, somewhere around 300 students 
outside. And she said, I saw pictures and they were outside. But they had a contingency plan, but they, you know, they, they didn't have to bring those into play. God's plans do not change. The Bible tells us that He has ordained whatsoever comes to pass, including what we consider to be interruptions or setbacks. We need to think about those interruptions and setbacks as opportunities that the Lord has given us to trust in Him and to minister to others. Job 23.13 says, But He, that is God, is unchangeable. And who can turn him back? What he desires, that he does. And his plan will be accomplished. By the way, this is what our Baptist forebears believed. In the uh, 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith, actually this is really the third form of that. There was a 1642 confession, and then there was a 16. 70-something confession, and then they kind of expanded on it in 1689. I have the text of the 1689 in my sermon notes, but I've got one that's not written in King James English that I'm going to read to you. It's a modern English version that was done by a guy who's an elder in a church down in Auburn, and he's a professor there, a Ph.D., and he took it and modernized the language. This is what they say. This is in chapter 3 called God's Decree. Have you ever heard of God's Decree, by the way? I had not heard that God had decreed things to take place until I got to Bible college. And it took me a while to be able to put my mind around it. In fact, I'm still putting my mind around that. I haven't fully grasped it all. But this is what um, chapter 3 in paragraph 1 says. From all eternity... God decreed everything that occurs without reference to anything outside Himself. He did this by the perfectly wise and holy counsel of His own will, freely and unchangeably. Yet God did this in such a way that He is neither the author of sin nor has fellowship with any in their sin. This decree does not violate the will of the creature or take away the free working or contingencies of second causes. On the contrary, these are established by God's decree. In this decree, God's wisdom is displayed in directing all things and His power and faithfulness are demonstrated in accomplishing His decree." Now, there are six more paragraphs in that, but I just wanted to to share that summary with you. This is what Baptists have held to historically. The first Baptist church was formed in 1609 in London. And beginning about that time, we started setting out and declaring what we believe as a group. And a large group. Uh, one of the, Benjamin Keach is one of those guys who taught Baptists how to sing hymns. Uh, was one of the signers. There are several in there, but that's a historical lesson you don't need uh, right now. But God has a plan, and that plan will be carried out. In fact, it will be carried out deliberately. That is the... Uh, That is point number three. And there we are with Psalm 15, 3 again. Our God is in the heavens. He does all that He pleases. Psalm 135, 6. Whatever the Lord pleases, He does. In heaven and on earth, in the seas and all deeps. Proverbs 16, 9. The heart of a man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. God, this is my comment, God does what He pleases whenever He wishes. God's plan is not implemented by accident or by chance. God carries out His plan. And His plan does not change. Now there is... Uh, a few years back, there was a movement 
uh, that has started uh, called open theism, talking about the openness of God. And they're saying God is not absolutely sovereign, but He's just so much smarter than us. He can figure things out and anticipate it. And it is a a growing doctrine. But God's plan does not change. He understands all things. Numbers 23, 19 says, God is not man that he should lie, or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not fulfill it? Again, Proverbs, excuse me, Job 23, 13. But he is unchangeable, and who can turn him back? What he desires, that he does. In the New Testament, Hebrews 6, verses 17 and 18, we read this. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character of his purpose, notice that, the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath, So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope that is set before us. The point of that verse is that we need to to find encouragement in the fact that God is on His throne, that He is the anchor for our soul, that He is the one in control, and though it may seem like things fall apart, we may be disappointed in what we perceive the circumstances to do, God is in control, and He is directing our steps, even though we may not. Kind of reminds me of the story I heard one time of a lady who was financially struggling, and she had... She didn't have any money, and she didn't have any food in the house, and she's on her knees praying, God, I need food. I don't know what I'm going to do. And she had a neighbor who was an atheist uh, or an agnostic at best, and, and he just says, well, I'm going to go show her. And she, he went out and bought some groceries and then went and put them on her porch and knocked on the door and ran away. And then the lady started praising God. Oh, thank you, God. Thank you for providing for me. And then he steps up and said, Lady, God didn't do that. I did. She said, The devil may have bought it, but God provided it. She had the right perspective. God is in control whatever the circumstances are. God's plan is to glorify Himself in what He does. And we can find strength in God's plan to keep on knowing that God is in control and when we are faithful, He will reveal His will to us. God's plan includes all things. That that is primary and secondary causes. Things that we would view as accidents or evil are included in God's plan. Now that's hard for us to grasp. By the way, you know, people say that, that the problem of evil proves that there is no God. Actually, it does the opposite. If there was not a God who established righteousness, how would we know there is evil? We need to, to think about that. You need to turn that argument around. If you're an atheist and you say evil means there is no God... How do you know what evil is? If everything is random and by chance, there is no such thing as evil at all. You've got to have a righteous standard before you know what evil is. Anyway, primary and secondary causes, whatever they are, and whatever underlying motives people may have, you know, God uses wicked people to accomplish His will. Nebuchadnezzar. God used wicked people to bring judgment on Israel throughout the Bible. God uses those things. But God's plan includes that. What's our verse that we quote all the time? Romans 8, 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. Romans eleven thirty six. For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be glory forever. Amen. 
God's plan includes whatsoever comes to pass. We don't, God has it all figured out and he's working all things to a purpose. Number six, God's plan will succeed. We, we read uh, several times now, Job 23, 13, but he is unchangeable and who can turn him? What he desires, that he does. War, peace, rain and drought, blessing and, blessing and punishment, life and death, all these things are under the purview of God. And the objection the people have is it doesn't look like or seem like God is in control. The difference in seeing God's control is a difference of faith. A.W. Pink, who was a pastor, actually, he, he was... Uh, he spent most of his time in, the, in Great Britain, but he pastored a, a Baptist church in South Carolina at one time. He, he died back in the 50s, I think. But he has a book called The Sovereignty of God. And there's a paragraph in there that I wanted to read for you. He says this, We readily acknowledge that life is a profound problem. And that we are surrounded by mystery on every side. But we are not like the beast of the field, ignorant of their origin and unconscious of what is before them. No, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, of which it is said, Ye do well, that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart. 2 Peter 1.19 and it is to this word of prophecy we indeed do well to take heed to that word which had not its origin in the mind of man, but in the mind of God. For the prophecy came not at any time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake, moved by the Holy Spirit. We say again, it is this word we do well to take heed. As we turn to his word, we are instructed thereout we discover a fundamental principle which must be applied to every problem. Instead of beginning with man and his word and working back to God, we must begin with God and work down to man. In the beginning, God. Apply this principle to the present situation. Begin with the world as it is today and try to work back to God and everything will seem to show that God has no connection with the world at all. But begin with God and work down to the world and light, much light, is cast on the problem. Because God is holy, His anger burns against sin. Because God is righteous, his judgments fall upon those who rebel against Him. Because God is faithful, the solemn threatenings of His Word are fulfilled. Because God is omnipotent, none can successfully resist Him. Still less overthrow His counsel. And because God is omniscient, no problem can master Him and no difficulty baffle His wisdom. It is just because God is who He is and what He is that we know we are now beholding on earth what we do. The beginning of His outpoured judgments in view of His inflexible justice and immaculate holiness, we could not expect anything other than what is now spread before our eyes. In the beginning, God. We start with Him instead of saying, this is the circumstances, what does God have of that? This is our holy and righteous God, and this is what was going on. Why do you think? It's because men and women and boys and girls are in rebellion against God, and He's outpouring His judgments on that. God is in control. He will never lose control. He is carrying out his purpose. Well, we're talking about the doctrine of the sovereignty of God. By the way, I was reading the book, and they were using Job as an example. You know, in Job, God allowed the devil 
to take away everything that belonged to Job except his wife. And she turned on him. And then he took Job's health. The writer of the book I was reading said, Job didn't have a problem with the sovereignty of God. He expresses God's sovereignty. What he had a problem with was the application of that doctrine to his life. And that's where we struggle. But we need to learn some things. That What should receiving this doctrine, understanding this doctrine, that God has a plan, that God's in control, that he's sovereignly carrying that out, what should it do to us? One, it should give us an anchor for our soul. Hebrews 6, 19 says this. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf having become a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. It should anchor us in the circumstances that we find us in. Secondly, this doctrine should humble us. It should take away all pride in what we've accomplished and give glory to God. Third, it should cause us to rejoice in God's grace. For it should give us a fresh outlook on submitting to the Lord and doing His will. Five, it should give us confidence when we witness. Because God, the Bible tells us here in chapter 1, God has predestined people to salvation. And when we share the gospel, people come to faith. Because the Holy Spirit takes the Word of God, which is the power of God into salvation, and makes them new. Six, it should cause us to worship to the praise of the glory of His grace. Seven, it should give us assurance. My salvation doesn't depend on me hanging on. It depends on God. There's a, a bluegrass gospel group called Chosen Road that I became acquainted with in the last few days. And they've got a song. It's an old gospel song. It says, I'm not holding on to Jesus. He's holding on to me. That should give us salvation. We, that, that, that's God's sovereignty. God's holding us. It should give us assurance. It should bring about repentance and submission. I'm trying to do my will. I'm trying to do my thing. And we need to surrender to God's will and say, Your will be done. Your will. Not my will, but your will be done. We should submit to Him. And seek to walk with Him. Not try to manipulate circumstances for our own outcomes. But trust God to do His work, His way, among His people. Nine, it should cause us to join Jude's exclamation in verses 24 and 25 of the book of Jude. Now to Him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of His glory with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, and now and forever. Amen! That should be our exclamation. When we see God is in control, we bow our hearts to Him and submit to Him. So let me ask you this question. Where are you in God's plan? Are you rebelling against it? Have you got a little side game going on? Or you think you have a side game going on? <laughs> and trying to work things out and manipulate? Surrender that to God. And say, Lord, do your will. The more basic question is, have you come to faith in Christ? Have you surrendered to Him? Have you accepted His free offer of salvation? You need to do that. Are you trusting Him daily? And are you seeking to obey Him and seeking His sanctification? The Bible says here that He predestined us for adoption 
that He wants to sanctify us. He wants to give us every spiritual blessing as you read that. Now, we, we've covered this in a very shallow manner. I have on my desk at home six or seven volumes of sermons that Martin Lloyd-Jones preached on Ephesians. There's a book this thick of sermons on chapter 1 of Ephesians. He spent several years exegeting this passage, preaching expositionally from this passage of Scripture. We cannot fathom the depths of God's character that is here. But we need to begin. And we need to be those who praise His glory. Now we're going to sing a hymn in just a moment, 443, I can't remember the name of it, and I've I, and I misplaced my bulletin. I surrender all. We're going to, to sing that in just a moment. Uh, if y'all want to come on in and get in place, I'm going to pray, and then I will uh, stand here to receive you. If you respond and want to respond, you can. Uh, if you need to know how to be saved, we'll be glad to open the Word with you and show you that, and then we will... Uh, or if you just need to come and pray, we invite you to do that. Father, move among us now in these moments as we seek to worship and honor you through our response to you. In Jesus' name, amen.